Today's topic is network programming. Um, we're getting to the end of our things we have to learn about Java. Um, and, uh, well, let's see. The goal of network programming is to get two machines um, in different spatial locations connected by the network, a network, to talk to each other. And uh, I guess I want to start out talking a little bit about the Internet. Um, you know, probably everybody in the world has been bombarded with stuff about the Internet the last five years or decades, but I want to kind of back up and give you some overview of the technology and what's going on under the covers, because um, some of it you have to be aware of. Um, so when you look at a typical network application, not the part that you write, but the part that's going on hidden from you, um, there is a whole stack of software going on. These, a lot of times you will see um, these layer cake drawings of various software layers. And what these mean is that there is kind of one conceptual abstraction down here which has an interface layer. Okay, this is some interface in the, in the kind of large interface sense. And then built on top of that and calling into that is yet another layer of software imposing yet another abstraction with other um, with other functionality, additional functionality, and then that gives you an interface at a higher level. And then on top of that, writing to that interface, there's another layer of software which gives you another interface. And this thing just, you, you build big layer cakes of these things. Uh, this is enormously common, enormously common, strange phrase, um, very common um, software organization. And if you, you know, work professionally in this, you will see scads of these. And you know, your job will either be to you know, build, build software up from some layer you know, using one of these layers of abstraction, or build the whole thing, or just use a stack. Um, the layer that we will probably be using, or you will be using for your um, project, is this layer down. And, uh, but let me start with the bottom up. The bottom layer in the standard network stack is the transport layer. Um, if you really get into networking and you study the network standards ISO book, there's actually seven layers in this layer cake. So uh, I'm kind of, if I leave out some of the seven layers, don't, uh, don't get upset. <laughs> but these are the ones you really need to keep in mind. The transport layer is the lowest level of thing that's going on. That is the electronics and the hardware and the underlying protocol that's moving bits physically from one machine over some wire to another machine that's connected to it by a wire. Um, so it's the most direct level of, of connection. And you know, there's the typical technologies are Ethernet cards, which um, will run through a physical wire, or um, in your case, you have a Ethernet probably running over a wireless network. It's more or less. <laughs> more or less. Running is a strong word. Right. Um, there's other transport protocols that will work over serial lines, so you can tap into the internet from dial-up modems. There's PPP, uh, which stands for point-to-point -point protocol. There's something called SLIP, which uh, is another um, serial line or modem type. Uh, internet connection. There's uh, other things besides Ethernet. There used to be a, a huge divergence of things aside from Ethernet, but Ethernet has, has grown and conquered, at least in a lot of uh, sort of office-type integration environments, or even home now. You can get a nice home Ethernet set up pretty easily. So all this does is move data from one part to, from one machine to another, and the data is organized into units that are essentially defined by the uh, hardware protocol. So it's going to send a chunk of data at a time and, uh, and ship it to the other side. On top of that, we have our friend IP for Internet Protocol. Okay, this is a protocol. A protocol is a um, conversational system between two machines that let them exchange messages and communicate. Okay, it's a language 
for two machines to speak to each other over the network, over a network. It basically involves machine one sending a message to machine two, machine two reading that and sending one back, or machine two expecting one and not getting it and sending a message back. So, um, The job of internet protocol um, is essentially packet routing. Okay, it, it is, internet protocol is the thing that makes the internet and it imposes a address space on all the machines in the world known as IP addresses. And at the moment, uh, the current version of this, which is IPv4, I believe, uh, the addresses consist of four 8-bit, uh, or four 8-bit units, four bytes, um, which are usually written as uh, dotted pairs. So, let's see, I believe our internal IP addresses are all 10, 11, 4, and then some other number. So I, this is, I believe, one of the TA machines, the IP address for one of the TA machines. This is just four bytes. So each one of these numbers can vary from between 0 and 255. Um, and they're just usually written with dots. So these, the goal is that each one of these four byte numbers uniquely identifies a machine on the internet. Okay, and you know, if you do you, the math, you get about two billion possible machines. Um, and we're probably running out of these um, just because of the way that things are clustered. So one of the jobs of IP, the I, uh, IP protocol, is to take a message from any machine in the network, okay, and you add into this message a source address, which is you, and a destination address, which is where you want to send it, and that destination address can be on some machine halfway across the world, and the job of IP and all of the technology in between which sorts IP is to make sure your packet gets there, or at least try to make sure your packet gets there. So it, using the transport layer, you, it basically gets sent in a series of hops. Okay? There is a network of routing that makes IP work. So even though your machine, okay, this machine, might not know where some foreign machine, say 140.16.0.1, is, okay, it might know exactly where to send it if this is on your local net. On the other hand, if it's not, it sends it to its routing machine. It has a rule that says, if I don't know where to send something, send it here, okay? Some machine on your local network. That machine has to be connected to some other machine which knows more about where to send things. So basically, things get routed from machine to machine, bounce from machine to machine across the network, and eventually, um, it'll end up here. Okay, usually the, the routing is done hierarchically so that this is kind of the most important place and then this and then this. So it first kind of routes up uh, to find you know, where this part is and then back down. But it doesn't have to. One thing about the current internet routing is uh, at least at the low levels, at, you know, at the lower parts of the tree, it's hardwired. So it's not dynamically routing. If your routing machine or some part goes out, um, you lose connectivity. At the higher levels, there's probably fancy technology to, uh, to switch over and fail over. But, but you know, your machine probably has a single place, single point where it's sending all of its messages to get them started. Um, but that's basically the job of IP. It sends these things called IP packets. And they have a number of pieces of information in them, a source address, a destination address, a uh, probably some idea of timeout, and then some fixed small amount of data. All right. So you basically send these, and because it's going through a variety of these pro of these um, hardware protocols, sometimes this data has to be broken up into several small packets to make it through this protocol. But then they're reassembled and and shot over. Um, IP makes no guarantees other than it's going to try and route your packet. Okay? It gives you no information 
as to whether your packet got there. It, um, uh, there's, and um, if you send a bunch of packets out, some of them might get there, some of them might not get there, and there's no guarantee in what order they're going to get there. Okay, so, um, so, but it does give you this namespace and routing capabilities. Okay, which sometimes is uh, all you need. It might give you order guarantees. I'm not sure. Come to think of it, um, the next layer. There's a lot of protocols built on top of IP that take advantage of this uh, naming scheme and routing scheme, and that basically gives us the current internet as we know and love it. Um, the most useful protocol that we'll see, the one that we'll use the most, is called TCP for Transmission Control Protocol, I believe. Um, there's other ones called uh, UDP. Do you know what UDP stands for? Um, I think it's Unreliable Delivery Protocol, but <laughs> I could be wrong. Um, and there's a handful more on top of that. TCP the, um, the abstraction that that maintains on top of IP is the notion of a connection and a stream. It basically maintains and implements a stream protocol over the network for you. So it lets you make a connection um, to some machine at some foreign address and gives you stream semantics on that connection so that you can read, do reads of random numbers of bytes from the connection, or do writes on random number of bytes in that connection. Yes? Sorry, but presumably these streams could get interrupted at any stage because you may have to wait you know, a millisecond or 10 seconds for the next packet of data or something. Oh, yes, and that's why the reads on the network can be blocking, and even the writes on the network can be blocking. Okay, but, but you do have the basic stream semantics, which has all sorts of nice guarantees that the data you send out is going to arrive reliably at the far end, and it's, gonna rely, it's going to arrive in the order in which you send it. Okay, so TCP is something that essentially makes a network connection look like a file connection or our console connection. Um, we've got nice stream semantics. Um, because you're operating over the network, you, you know, its feel is going to be kind of different. Um, its reads are probably go you're going to be blocking more on reads than you are, say, reading from a file because the data is coming in unevenly from another source, a foreign source, and the network could be slow or fast or there could be hiccups. Similarly, when you write, you don't often get blocking writes when you write to the terminal or when you write to a file. But networks, you can get blocking rights to because, um, again, we have this pipe metaphor. And this pipe can only hold so much stuff in it until somebody, starts, until somebody has to take stuff off the other side. Um, and so if you are um, feeding stuff in at very high rates and somebody's taking out at slow rates, eventually everything will back up and your rights will start blocking. And you won't be able to stick anything more into the pipe until somebody reads in something into it. Um, what else do we say about that? Again, uh, in contrast to writing to a file, a stream on a file, or a stream on a um, terminal, these are a little bit more fragile because there's a lot of technology getting your packets to you know, some machine on the internet. So it can happen that the whole process will break down, that the communication path will break down, the foreign machine will crash, or one of the intermediate machines will crash. And so this stream connection can just break, OK? And you'll get some exception back from the stream that says it's broken, and you'll have to deal with that. You don't often get that from a file or the terminal. But uh, it's one of the things you have to compensate for. Um, on top of TCP, then, once we have this reliable stream protocol, okay, um, there's all sorts of application protocols built on top of this. And, uh, and uh, application protocols are, again, a type of conversation between, uh, 
between different programs, and in this case, they're at a higher level and they're geared towards some particular application. There's a bunch that run on top of TCP. There's a bunch that run on top of UDP. Um, UDP is a more packet-driven protocol. You send, rather than stream semantics, it's packet semantics. And it has less guarantees in terms of reliability and the like. Um, but on the other hand, it takes less technology and is uh, a little more lightweight than TCP. So a lot of the kind of internet telephony and um, uh, some of the streaming uh, probably uses, the internet telephony definitely uses UDP. Um, some of the streaming may use UDP as well because uh, it's more lightweight and you're, you're, uh, you're doing less work. So, it, so it's running a little faster at the rate, at the cost of a certain um, amount of unreliability if the network, yes, has so problems. If you didn't have the stream connection layer at all, yeah. then you would still get data, but it would just be all over the place? Or? Programming in IP is um, uh, difficult. Yes, you essentially get a, a, a sequence of packets out of IP. Okay, and you know the source from which they came, and you get some data. And that's pretty much it. There's some other header fields there. Okay, so what TCP does is it, you know, takes your IP packet and then adds some more TCP header information on the packet that organizes it in terms of connections and streams and which packet this is in, in the order and whether you lost any and that sort of thing. Um, and builds in timeouts and buffer sizes and all the stuff to make it work. So yes, you can program on top of um, IP directly, but it is not a happy thing. So is it the TCP that sends a request to the sender for uh, new packets if it detects mis missing packets? Yes, it does. Um, uh, well, I think both at various layers will do it, but mainly TCP is going to do retries. Yeah, now I'm I'm getting fuzzy in my old age as to which one of those does the uh, which one of them has sequence numbers, but I think it, I believe it is all in the TCP, but but don't don't hold me to that. One other thing I want to say about IP addresses is there's a magic one, which is often useful to know. One twenty seven zero zero one. Um, is a magic one call that refers to yourself, okay? So this one, no matter what machine that you are running it on and connecting to, is always going to just loop back and talk to yourself. So it's a good way to um, debug your network code, is just loop back and connect to yourself. Okay, um, network stacks. How do we, since I said we were going to uh, operate at the TCP level, the major programming abstraction for operating at the, piece, at the TCP level is called sockets. This is pretty, this metaphor is pretty uniform now across the programming community. Pretty much every system I can think of that you would be programming in would give you a sockets layer to, to run TCP um, and sometimes even UDP connections over. I believe it originated at, uh, from some work at Berkeley on Unix, but has since been propagated. Um, so there's a Windows implementation and uh, for other machines. And a socket is essentially just, think of it as just a TCP connection, or in some case, a UDP connection to a remote machine that's giving you these stream semantics. Um, and um, unlike the case in the uh, streaming I.O. where Java gives you a great deal of complexity um, and it's much harder to do than, say, in a C, C++ environment, in the network space, it's just much easier. They have hidden all the ugly stuff and given you exactly the three or four things that you need to do what you want to do. So uh, the network programming in Java is much more of a pleasure. Sockets now in Java are going to be objects, which are of class socket. And to make one of these guys, you just call the constructor new socket. And two arguments, host name, 
and pour. Okay. Um, host name can either be one of these guys as either a string in that format or uh, Java will give you, there's an object we'll talk about later that represents internet addresses. Or you can use a host name, you know, like www.rsdigited.com. Um, on top of the IP naming scheme, and somewhat different from it, there is this domain naming scheme where you get to use text strings to name machines or, or destinations. And that is maintained by a different set of protocols and a different set of machines on the network, okay, all of which running on top of IP underneath. But its job is to take one of these strings, like um, oursdigited.com, and turn it into an IP address for you. And so this is uh, the DNS system. Um, and so the first thing, if you were programming this at the very lowest level, and somebody uh, gave you a uh, name like rsdigital.com, uh, you'd first have to use DNS to look it up um, and translate it into an IP address, and then you'd have to open a socket on the IP address. And um, Java nicely does all that for you. Okay, So this command, where this is a string and that's an integer, uh, does about a page worth of C code for you, of rather obscure C code. So very, very nice. Um, a word about the port. The port is another notion um, connected by or imposed by uh, this protocol layer is when you um, talk to a machine, you would like to talk to a specific application. On a given foreign machine, there could be dozens of programs running Okay, and you not only have to say, I want to talk to this machine, you have to say, I want to talk to this program on this machine. Okay, and the way you select essentially which program you want to talk to are these port numbers. All right, and these are just integers. Um, usually they're small integers, but they can be larger integers. And essentially two machines across the network have to agree if they want to communicate on some program, um, have to agree to talk to each other and listen, you know, request and listen for connections on a given port. So every application you can think of, um, in order for me to talk to, say, a web server on a foreign machine, I not only have to know what, um, what the internet address is, I have to know what port it's listening on. Now, fortunately, most standard programs, network programs that you use, have standard ports, so you don't have to know, you know which one it's running on on each machine. And uh, if you remember your, that HTTP URL syntax, it's uh, hostname colon port. OK. It lets you explicitly specify the port if you happen to know that some web server is running on a non-standard port. Each port can handle multiple threads. Right, right. When we talk about server side, this is, if you're a client, um, how you would do a connection. The uh, metaphor for most of these TCP programs is that you have a client and you have a server hence the term client-server architecture. And um, the server, for any given program, is listening on a port. So uh, web servers typically listen on port 80. All right? Clients, when they want to um, connect to a web server, do this connection to the port. So this guy would do a... Uh, make a socket on a machine, call it um, foo.com, comma 80, and that would make a connection and start a communication here. 
So what really this is going to do is as soon as it gets this connection, it's kind of going to take the end of this guy and make another connection here, we'll see, and start talking over this. And now this guy is going to be free, the port 80 is going to be free to, to uh, accept more sockets. So every time somebody makes a request here, this end of the connection gets bound to some other, it creates a new socket and binds it and ships it back. So, so this guy is always listening on a given port. So if you're a client and want to connect to any machine at any port, you just make one of these. You just do this, and it gives you a new socket. Uh, some dangers here. Uh, this is a constructor, and like constructors on uh, like our uh, file input stream, lots of things can go wrong. Okay, Some of the things being this host name could be bogus, that there's no machine that the DNS server can translate that to. So that's one thing. Um, the IP address that you try and, you know, it could have a legitimate IP address, but the foreign machine could be down or unreachable or too busy to talk to you. Uh, most of those are going to be indistinguishable because your attempt to connect will simply time out. Or if it's almost too busy to talk to you, it probably is, it has enough CPU to send you a rejection and say, you know, I, I am here, but I'm not going to accept your connection. That's another possible response from this thing. So there's lots of things can go wrong, which means we have to wrap it in a try. Exactly. So you wrap all these guys in a try block, have catch handlers for all the things that can go wrong. Um, and uh, if you're lucky, the thing will connect. Once it connects, you're uh, ready to rock, really. You can get this thing will have a, this thing has a get input stream and uh, get output stream methods. Okay, and these, once you have a socket, you can get the input stream and output stream methods and then start gluing up those chains of stream things that whatever you want to use. For example, if you want to send text, you would build a, uh, a, some kind of buffered reader and buffered writer on top of these things. If you wanted to send binary data, you'd probably put a, a buffered input stream and a data, um, a data input stream on top of it or a data output stream on top of it. So you just, once you've got one of these things, you just treat it like you know, you've got it from file open stream and and build up the normal set of connections, and then use the normal stream read and write stuff, or println, or whatever you like, on, to run on streams to, uh, to work on these. So that basically, everything you learned on how to do file I.O. ports nicely over to network I.O. The only thing new is to make the connection, you have to do this, and then get your input and output stream. Why, why do you say this port is like a program? It looks more like it's like a, like a pipe. Well, the port, the port is just a number. It's an, a special number in that everybody kind of has agreed on this number. So what is going on in our server machine is that there is a program. Let me draw it in. Say we're using Apache Web Server. So we have Apache running here on our, this machine. And what Apache is doing is listening on this socket for connections. Okay, So uh, port 80 has a web server listening for connections. And as soon as some client connects, it's going to make one of these sockets. And that kind of will propagate back. And then this will succeed. And you're ready to talk to, to do the actual communication protocol. Yeah? I know like one of the things that people do is they like probe your ports. What are they waiting for? Or looking for? Oh, well, you basically, you know, you can write a program that cycles through all those port numbers on your machine, okay? And you just r increment through them and see if this call succeeds on any of them. Okay, if it succeeds on any of them, that means you have a stream in which you can talk into some program, all right? In general, you might not know what program it is, but, you know, then you can try, once you've got a connection into that machine, you can try and do stuff. Okay. 
Um, and well, let's talk about what kinds of uh, let's talk about protocols for a sec. Um, yeah. Well, all of these. This might be leading into what you're just going to. Um, these, since you have a, two autonomous things, every time one guy writes, the other guy has to be ready to read on this stream, right? And so they have to know something about. Um, it's not quite that tightly synchronized in that the both the TCP layer and hopefully the IO stream layer on both sides is going to provide some buffering. So when you're writing, you probably want to use a buffered writer and a buffered reader. The guy on the other side will. And the TCP protocol will provide some limited set of buffering. And if not, it'll block so that if you're trying to write, you'll just sit there trying to shove data in until somebody pulls something out, in which case it'll succeed. So, um, well, so now we know how to open a connection on a random port, and we know how to send data and read data just using these read and writes. So now all we have to do is figure out how to do something intelligent over that connection. And that's where, again, cooperation comes in. Um, and cooperation over the network is in form of protocols. Network protocols are essentially the network equivalent, the network communication equivalent of what maybe interfaces are in the larger sense to modules that are communicating by method calls. Okay? If you have, say, a library you want to use, the way you would specify that library is to give the list of method calls that you can make into this library, what they're going to do and what they're going to return. All right? Now, in most of these protocols, you are not running so, uh, something similar to a method call, but nonetheless, you want to do the same sort of thing that you're, you want to provide a network service, you're a server, so you want to say, okay, I'm going to provide this sort of service to you, and the way you get access to these services is you send me this message and I'll send you this data back. You send me this request, I'll answer that. So it's not really a procedure call, but there is this conversation that goes back and forth that's agreed upon like a um, procedure or method-based interface um, that will tell you how to do all the capabilities you can do. And these things run under the notion of uh, application protocols. And there's a lot of them. And uh, problem set three will have you writing one or implementing one. You don't have to design it. Um, some of the favorite ones are uh, HTTP, which is the web protocol. There is FTP, which is a file transfer protocol. Um, SNTP, SMTP is uh, the, one of the mail transfer protocols, right? Uh, there's a protocol for Telnet for remote connecting into a machine. There's a protocol for finger, which will give you information about who's logged into a machine. There's a protocol for ping, um, which just tells you whether the machine is up. Um, let's see, what other? There's NNTP, which is the protocol for net news. Um, hmm? No, I think NNTP is TCP, yeah. yeah. Um, and to give you a flavor of how these work, I've um, given you in the notes a, um, a clip of a sample NNTP protocol transaction, or actually a, a number of different transactions, so you can see what, um, what goes back and forth across the network. NNTP is a text-based protocol. Text-based protocols are nice for debugging because you can debug them with Telnet and you can look at the messages that you send and send back and you can actually read them. Uh, a lot of protocols are binary protocols that you send, you know, a sum, it'll, the protocol description will send you, will give you some map of a packet that you're supposed to send and tell you, you know, bits 0 through 8 have this data, bits 8 through 16, or maybe bytes 0 through 8, and you have to, you know, basically make something data structure that looks like this and ship it out in binary form. Um, they're more concise, but they're diff more difficult to debug. I think the Nutella protocol, which you're going to implement, has a little of each. So, so fun for all. So if you just look at this protocol, it's um, 
you know, the S is what the server sends, and uh, the C is what the client does. And it starts out with the server listening on a port. And um, each one of these applications I talked about has a standard port associated with it. So you know when you want to talk to some service on a machine, you can guess at where it's going to be running, or most likely. And the port for NetNews is 119. So if you want to connect to any NNTP server, um, you would try and make a socket to one of these on port 19. And um, when a port, you know, so the server's listening on that port. We'll talk about how to do that in Java in a sec. The client connects, and then the server acknowledges that the client has connected and things are up by sending a message. And uh, it just sends that uh, 200 my name, new server ready stuff. So what's the 200? 200, a lot of these text-based protocols start out each, each reply with a message, an error code. Okay, So it tells you um, whether things succeeded or if it didn't succeed, what kind of error there was. Um, 200 is success, I believe, in uh, the 200 series are various types of successes in NNTP. Um, I think 200 series is also success in HTTP. Does anyone know? Does anybody remember? I think it is, yeah. And like the 400 series is uh, file not found, and the 500 series of errors is illegal operation on server. And then there's some 300s and 100s. So if we tried to make a, a net news connection to some, some server that didn't have net news? Well, then, then this would not succeed, OK, because there'd be nothing listening on that port, OK? okay. Or, indeed, if there was something listening on that port and it wasn't net news, then you'd get some, you know, you'd probably get some random reply back. Okay, so basically, if you're the client, you're going to connect and you're going to listen to that, listen for that first 200 something something new server ready to ensure that what you talk to really is a net server, a net news server. But does it have to say, like, news server ready there? Um, I believe that the, the protocol will specify which parts of that line are required and which parts. This is just an example. And there's a protocol spec that will tell you exactly what's required and exactly what's optional. OK, and then as you go on, it's a series of transactions where the client sends a command word in text and then a carriage return. And then the server sends data back. And then the client sends another command, server sends, you know. And if you've ever written, say, something to connect to net news, you know, to get, you have to do a number of these transactions just to get started. You have to get the list of news groups and send which news groups you're interested and then get the headers. And, uh, you know, so there's a lot of back and forth going on to behind the, uh, the user interface that you see. Um, let's see. Going back to your question, the fact that there's all of these standard things running on ports um, gives people an opportunity to, uh, for mischief, um, depending on how secure people have made their server machines. You know, there's Telnet, which runs on port 25. There's Finger, which I think runs on port 23 or 21. So there's all these ports with these standard services on them that um, anyone on the network connecting to one of these machines has a reasonable opportunity to um, to expect. So unless you've secured your machine, anybody could attach to port 25 on your machine, open a socket. The machine will respond if it's running Telnet server. And unless you've told it not to, probably it started one up on boot. And now people have this connection to Telnet into your machine. The next problem is how to log in, but that's just a matter of password guessing. So, uh, so and Finger, uh, you, it will send, it can, anybody can connect and ask for who's logged in or uh, is this person logged in. So there's probably somewhere between a half dozen and a dozen of these things that, that typically come up on, uh, on boot if, if in default configurations of, uh, of servers that are just there uh, listening on ports for connections that anybody can connect to. Um, so uh, just as a side note, one of the, yeah? Uh, well, finish your side. Uh, I was going to say one of the standard attacks on these 
is to take advantage of sloppy implementation of the server. Okay? Um, most of these holes have been closed by now, but one of the early set of holes was you could connect to one of these servers and send a message that's bigger than the message expected by the protocol. And sloppy implementations will take that overrun and uh, do something bad with it so, and, and let you gain control of, uh, of the machine. Uh, most of these, as I say, most of these bugs have been patched, but, uh, but that uh, is a, uh, a warning against sloppy programming and an argument for bounds checking on arrays. Okay. <laughs> if you don't have bounds checking on your arrays and somebody, you, know, you let some outside program write into one of these arrays, you know, the, the data at the end of that array is going to be vulnerable. Okay, so, so uh, you know, just as good practice. Java does not let you do this, but other languages certainly do. Uh, let you uh, write into arrays without bounds checking. So, um, in your notes, there is a short program. Yes. Oh, I was going to ask. Uh, I don't really know much about firewalls, but it seems like don't aren't firewalls going to maybe block? input to one of these ports or something like that? Yes. One thing firewalls will do is, you know, they restrict connections to the number of ports, certainly. Um, and uh, um, they... Do we need to know anything about firewalls when we're setting up these sockets, or is that just automatic? No, I think that our... Um, Sockets at this layer, I'm not sure, need, I don't think need to know about firewalls, okay? If there's a firewall that's preventing this, it's just going to fail. Okay, what you might have to know about is proxy servers, okay? And a proxy server is something that is sitting on your firewall that's going to let some subset of, you know, kind of get you around the firewall in some, uh, for some subset of connections. And that means you have to, instead of, uh, talking directly to the port, you're really talking to the firewall, telling it you want to talk to the port. Um, so there's some added complexity in that, and the book goes into that a little bit. Um, we are not connected to via a firewall, um, I believe, so I think we can just go out and uh, ravage. Uh, <laughs> the only trick is we, we don't have um, assigned DNS numbers. That's true. So I guess doing. That's true. Um, Kind of a detail uh, that's a little bit, but not really relevant to the project. Um, going back to how IP numbers are assigned. Nothing to do with Java programming, but how IP numbers are assigned. There's two ways. They can be assigned statically by your network administrator. He can just go to each machine and lock down an IP address, um, which is good uh, in that the IP address is stable over time. But if you have a network that people want to add machines to dynamically, like if you want to bring in your laptop and plug it into the network and have it work, that's not very satisfactory because your laptop won't have an IP address on a strange network. Um, so there's a yet another protocol called DHCP, which is, uh, allows you to dynamically distribute um, IP addresses on a subnet. So, and that's what this system runs here. So when you plug in a new machine or boot your machine, the machine will go out to the DHCP server and it'll say, I need an IP address. This is who I am. Uh, this is, you know, my Ethernet card and the like. And it will, the DHCP server will give you what's called a lease on, a, um, on an IP address. And that lease is valid for a certain number of days or hours, or usually it's valid for two weeks. And uh, then it has to be renewed, and it could give you a different one or the same one. Um, in practice, if you don't have a very dynamic network, which we don't, you typically always get the same IP address when you renew. And so your IP address is stable over time. I think I've had the same one on Media One for, uh, for years. Um, and certainly, over the course of the, the project that you will do, um, hopefully all of your IP addresses will remain static. So when you're talking to each other's machines, you will always be talking to each other's machines. Unfortunately, we don't have 
any DNS server running on uh, for your machines. So your machines do not know, have any domain names. Um, maybe we'll try and set that up. Probably it's it's a little too much of a hassle. So your all machines are called like local domain dot local host or something or local host dot local domain. Um, so we'll have to um, communicate through IP addresses. Yes. Ah, that's true. That's true, and we all have, uh, that's a good thought. So we could give you all machine names, which I think would be much more, much more mnemonic than, uh, than those. <laughs> but we need to know those, and so one thing I would like you to do is there is a, well, I'll wait till the end of class. By the way, what does DHCP stand for? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes you get lost in the acronyms. Sometimes you get lost in the acronyms. Um, there's all sorts of protocols that support this. There's an, uh, like ARC and then an RARC and uh, uh, it's, but each one of these has, each one of these protocols, if you want to know about them, has not only a standard um, uh, Port, but there are these are all defined on the internet, and they're usually defined in a document called RFC for re request for comment. In the early days of the internet, these were basically made up by people who wrote a piece of software that did this sort of thing and wanted to share it with everybody, and they wanted other people to be able to hook into it. So they published these protocols in uh, these RFC documents and just put them out so people could read them. Uh, nowadays, of course, there's, there's big international standards committees that are pretty much doing the same thing. RFC stands for Request for Comment. One thing we haven't talked about, um, let's see, there's a, a piece of code in your notes, which unfortunately I can't run today, that is that will open up a connection to port 80, the HTTP port, and do a simple HTTP command HTTP is another text-based protocol, and the command for just getting a file for download is particularly simple. You just have to write get, and then the path name, the thing that follows this in your URL. Okay, so get slash path. Yes, all capital get. And then a space, then the path, then a space then HTTP and whatever version you're pretending to be, so 1. Point slash 1.0 will probably work, and then backslash n, backslash n, meaning exactly two carriage returns at the end of that, okay? So if we dump this string, so what this URL means is open a socket on this host name and this port, and then do a get, with this path, just take the rest of this string, put it here, embed it in here, send that message off. If you do this in Java you'll ha on Stream.io, you must do a flush, I've discovered. Otherwise, only part of it gets over and the connection times out. So make sure you flush your network connections after every message. Um, and then read stuff on the socket. And the thing you will, you'll just do read lines, and what will come back on that socket is the the uh, HTTP, or the uh, HTML, rather, for that page. So if I did get slash, um, if I just did slash on arsdigita.com port 80, I would get the, the home page of Ars Digita. And granted, you know, it would be in raw HTML. You'd see all the angle brackets. You wouldn't have it nicely displayed. But, but uh, that's what that little program does. Now, if, uh, it happened to be on a Um, good point. The URLs, okay, the definition of URLs, including path parts, is yet another network protocol standard, and it has another RFC, and the RFC specifies um, that everything has to work with forward slashes. Um, it might say that things can work with reverse slashes as well. Java has some facilities for setting the path specifier, I think, but the, the path name separator. But the 
the specification for path names and URLs, since it is a network protocol, has to be specified independent of any particular machine architecture. So uh, to figure out how things are supposed to work, you can go to the URL, pro, uh, the URL RFC. And, and it will also tell you all sorts of things like how is relative file name resolution supposed to work. Um, and how, you know, if you in HTML you can specify a partial path name, okay, you can specify just some ending of this, and the system will automatically concatenate some beginning part, which it thinks is correct, and it will tell you all the rules to this, okay. Um, you do not want to implement all of the rules for that, and uh, the process of taking apart and dealing with URLs is a sufficient hassle that Java has given you URL connection classes that particularly handle HTTP, the HTTP protocol, the URL protocol, and um, even some classes that will handle H HTML. So if you look at the end of the network book, the, uh, the network chapter in volume two, you'll see a bunch of classes that, result, that uh, talk about URLs and URL connections, HTTP connections. So they're just utility classes. They essentially work the same, except they know about uh, HTTP and uh, the commands you can send. Um, so if you were really doing a, a, a web server, you would, or some web application, you would want to use those classes, most likely. Um, OK, one thing we have not talked about, we talked about how to connect as a client. We have not talked about, in Java, how to be a server. So uh, I think I'm going to erase the brain for that so everybody can see. This is, again, way simple. There is another class called server socket. I'll call it SS equals new server socket. And then you just give it an integer, which is what port you want to listen on. All right. So as I said, the server wants to start up something that listens for incoming connections on the socket. And this is the thing you create is server socket. And this doesn't, now you need a way to, when somebody actually connects to you, get that connection and do something with it. So the magic method on server socket is called accept socket s equals ss dot accept. OK? And what accept will do when you call it is block on that port. OK? This code will just sit there in the, in the uh, lower levels of the network system waiting for somebody to connect to you, OK? Um, and as soon as somebody does connect to you, it will do this business of taking the end of the socket that they're trying to create, creating a socket on your side that corresponds to the stream on their side, and return to you this. So it's going to make a socket object, which is different than your server so socket object, and, uh, and return it to you, OK? And now, once you have this on the server end, you now then get your input stream, your output stream, and you're ready to talk to the client via whatever protocol that you've agreed on to talk about, sending bytes or text or whatever. Um, one twist on this is that uh, once you do an accept, this thread uh, is continuing to execute. He's no longer blocked. And there's nobody here that's going to accept the next guy who tries to connect. Right? The only way you can get a connection is if you have some thread in the accept, running accept. Okay? So if you only want to handle one client at a time, you could just you know, make one of these and then run a loop that they called accept and then did you know, serviced one client, closed the connection, and then went back and waited for a new connection. Um, if you want to accept multiple 
uh, want multiple people, if you want to handle multiple servers, what you have to do is every time you get an accept, you need to fork off a new thread to to handle this connection. So, and you give it this socket, and then this guy just goes back and waits for somebody else to connect. So you have one thread that's basically in this accept loop, just waiting for, your, for people to connect to you. And then as, as they come in and connect to you, you're kind of spawning off threads saying, here, deal with this guy, deal with this guy, deal with this guy, deal with this guy. Okay? It's one of the reasons we did the thread lecture before the network lecture, because you need to, if you're running a server and you want to serve a, a variety of clients, you basically need to be able to spawn off threads, server threads, that will um, perform the function. These are all running the same kind of server side of the code, but they're all running in parallel now because you could have you know, tens or hundreds or, in the case of a web server, thousands of people uh, connecting to you. But that's all the calls you need to know for the network stuff. Yes? At what point are you referring to a physical entity, like the, the socket that object? Talking about getting access to a program. Right. President of the program. Is it the port? Is that? Nope. The only physical entries in this whole thing are way down here. Okay. Everything else is a software abstraction built on top of the only physical entry entities in this whole thing that you can touch are the network card in your machine and then the wire coming out of your machine or the wireless coming out of your machine <coughs> and um, the corresponding connection on the other side and then you know you could trace that physical connection through the world but everything on top is mythological it's entirely abstractions created by massive amounts of software layer after layer after layer so port is an addressing scheme just like IP is an addressing right. scheme right it's just something that people agreed to there's no like if you look at the back of a computer there's no like ports it's it's entirely it's entirely uh, an agreed upon scheme between people um, implemented by that layer. Does server socket have method, a method you override that actually then gets the connection when the connection happens? Is that the way? No, it's this, this accept thing is the thing that gets the connection. And that, and that returns to a socket. And that oh. socket you can do reads and writes on. How, how do you know the IP numbers are unique when they send them? Is there a huge database that you check? Um, well, there are rules to assigning the IP addresses uh, to make the routing work. And um, essentially, at the beginning of time, the namespace was sliced up. Okay? And some small number of people, uh, so each, you know, this namespace is divided um, by rule among various organizations in the world. There are a small number of people who are around at the beginning of the ARPANET who have um, namespaces that only fix this number and so have a namespace that is huge in that it's 24 bits worth of IP addresses. Okay? MIT has one of these called Class A namespaces. Uh, digital Equipment uh, has a Class A namespace, which I think starts with 16. Does anybody know MIT's? Compact, right. I used to work there, so I should know. Um, uh, that's one of the things Compact got when they uh, bought digital, is this beautiful Class A namespace. BMW has a Class A namespace? Really? Wow. Uh, a lot of universities and uh, the government have one of these. Then there's, there's some of these high digits that are restricted to what's called class B, which fix these two numbers. And of course, there are more of those, but each one is smaller because it only has, um, you can only vary that bit. And then some people have uh, these smaller namespaces that only have 256. So these are like divvied up around the world. And then there's a lot of cheating going on because, you know, the way these divvy up is not necessarily, you know, the way these machines like Ours Digital Loan could probably fill up an entire one of these things, 
and uh, we probably have more machines than that. So what you do is kind of behind various layers of gateway, you assign local IP addresses, which then get kind of funneled into real IP addresses and then, um, and then expanded back out. So there's lots of games you can play. But at the lowest level, if either DHCP screws up or your network administrator screws up, and on your local network assigns two machines with the same address, um, very bad things, very confusing things will happen because packets will go all over the place and, and machines won't know what to do and they'll be talking to each other. And uh, I once gave a talk at a conference where they were using some DHCP-like thing that wasn't working very well, and people would come up and give their talks and try and demonstrate their websites. Um, but, and then the next speaker would get up and connect into the same thing, and sometimes the DHCP was not functioning properly. They weren't getting unique IP addresses, so you, know, you were getting somebody else's demo on your machine, or your demo wasn't working, and it was unfortunate. But uh, things are better now. Um, last thing, the internet address class. Uh, Java has some utilities, a class called uh, inet adder, or inet address, which just has a bunch of nice routines on it for manipulating uh, internet addresses. They can take host names and do the lookup, or, uh, or you know, turn these things from text to binary to string to whatever. Um, and then one thing that's good is there's static methods on here that will let you read the um, host name and IP address of your machine. Uh, there's also a Unix command that'll print that out called ifconfig, right? It's something, yeah, ifconfig under, uh, under Linux. One word, and it'll type out a bunch of data. So what I need from you for problem set three, so we can get our infrastructure organized, is um, if everybody would either run the program that's in the back of your notes, which basically uses this to detect your IP and host name, or run ifconfig and um, print out on a piece of paper your name and uh, IP address of the machine you're working on. Uh, that way we can set up a, uh, a uh, some kind of host name naming scheme or just know when we try and connect to each other what namespace we have to work with. If you want to put your, a name for your computer too, we'll, we'll set up a host file. So think of something fun. Okay, so yeah, on that piece of paper also, if you don't want your email address, which will be the default name, um, yeah, come up with something uh, not too fun, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but reasonably fun. Okay, that's it.